ready for you to receive it. And I think we're in a place in the church where the signs of the spirit and the signs of the flesh are in this battle where we accept the signs of the flesh more than the signs of the spirit. There was a time three years ago when me and Kayla woke up to a violent noise in our house. And some of you have had this experience where you've woken up to your fire alarms going off. Has anybody ever had that happen? Where your fire alarms are going off and it's violent. You don't know what's happening. It's three o'clock in the morning and your ears are piercing. It feels like your eardrums are about to explode. This happened to us a few years ago and, and I wake up in a frenzy. I don't, I don't know what to do, but I know something absolutely has to be done. My friends, there are signs in the Spirit where the Spirit is calling deep to deep. Deep cries out to deep. The Spirit's trying to get inside of our spirits and make us wake up, make us do something. It is the end of days. Time is growing short. And the Spirit says, wake up, sons and daughters of God. Start prophesying. Wake up, old men and women. Start having visions and dreams and prophesy out of your mouth. It is time for fire and you can't deny it. And the problem that I've witnessed in the last at least couple years, but really for all of, all of humanity's time here on earth, is we're really good at responding to alarms in the flesh, but not the spirit. When you're thirsty, what do you do? You go get a drink. When you're hungry, what do you do? You go get something to eat. But when you get a warning sign from God, what do most of us do? We don't do what we're supposed to do. We don't walk in obedience to the spirit. I hear it all the time. Oh, I feel so distant from my church family. Well, you haven't been to church in six weeks. Yeah. Where's the distance coming from? And most of the time, hear me, hear me out of love and grace today. Most of the time when that happens, oh, yeah, you know, we were friends with that person, but like, you know, I feel like there's this distance and we haven't been to church, so what do I do? I know I should go back to church because I'm the one creating the distance, but I just stay away longer and longer. I'll just watch online a little bit to get back in, but I'm watching online and it's a million miles away and I never come back to church and all of a sudden the church is the enemy. My friends that were at church are now judging me. The pastor doesn't love me. He hasn't called on me. It's, it's all of a sudden, it's like I should have listened to the warning signs that said, hey, you're far away from the church and get back to church. And we do this to God too. You start feeling distant from God. What do you do? You start blaming God. You stop reading your word. You stop praying. The only things that connect you to the heart of God, you stop doing because you feel distance. It's backwards. When you're thirsty, you go to water. When you're hungry, you go to food. But the devil has twisted our mind up so badly. When we're thirsty for the Spirit and hungry for the Word, the devil tells you to run away from it, and we do it. He catches us hook, line, and sinker. And we end up living a life of just not following the will of the Spirit, not hearing the warning and hearing what we're supposed to do. Church, it's been happening since Jesus ascended, and it's going to happen until he does descends. There are spiritual warnings blaring in our ears this morning, and we need to respond. If you want a fighting chance in this life to have some power, you need to respond today and every day that you wake up. Turn to Acts chapter 2. You knew we were going to be here today. Somebody said, I really like knowing where you're going because then I can read the scripture ahead of time. It's like, yeah, that's great, isn't it? Acts chapter 2. We're going to be in Acts chapter 2 where we see the Holy Spirit fall on the early church. I'll start in verse 1. Also, my title today is Explain. We're going to explain some things today. I believe the Spirit falls to explain things that you're wondering, things you have questions in. Acts chapter 2. When the day of Pentecost came... They were all together in one place. Suddenly, say suddenly. Suddenly, a sound like a blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now, they were staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. When they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment, because each one heard their own language being spoken. 
Utterly amazed, they asked, aren't all of these who are speaking Galileans? Then how is it that each of us hears them in our native language? Parthians, Medes, Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, Asia, um, two words that start with P that I'm not going to try, Egypt and parts of Libya near Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs. We hear them, catch this, we hear them declaring the wonders in our own tongues. Amazed and perplexed, they asked one another, what does this mean? What does this mean? Verse 13, where we'll stop today. And we're going to be in Acts chapter 2 for two more weeks, by the way. So this is going to be a good few weeks, amen? Verse 13, some, however, made fun of them and said, they have had too much wine. They've had too much wine. Some of them said, what does all this mean? They were really interested. What does this mean? And some were just like, they had too much wine. We know this, 2,000 years removed, that the the apostles and the disciples that were in that upper room, they experienced the fire of the Holy Spirit. A mighty rushing, violent wind came into the upper room, and it didn't stay there once the fire landed on the disciples. It had to, to go out. Fire spread like a wildfire. The crowd came to, to the upper room around the, the house in bewilderment. What is going on in there? What does this mean? The world was curious. The world was curious because of this experience of fire. This experience of fire. What does this mean? Today, here's what it means for us. You can experience the fire that you see in Acts chapter 2. If you obey, accept, recognize, but most of all, if you respond to the sounds of the Spirit in your life. Today, all of you in here have heard the sound of the Spirit. Even if you're not saved, you've been on the outside of the upper room and wondered, what is that? Maybe you were scrolling on Instagram or Facebook and you saw 25 people get baptized on Sunday. That was the sound of the Spirit saying, come here, son, come here, daughter, experience the fullness of who I am. Maybe you just heard your neighbor talk and maybe it was a family member did something in the church and you just heard the Spirit. Maybe you've been a Christian your whole life and you come to church every single time the doors are open and every time you're standing in the chairs, you feel this draw, you feel this pulling in your spirit and you don't know what it is. You're like, what does this mean? It's the fire of God trying to invite you in. It's the sound of the Spirit. It's the sound of the Spirit. And I want to go through a few sounds that we see in Acts chapter 2 that we absolutely have to respond to today. I have to respond to them today, same as you. The sound of prayer, the first sound of the Spirit we see in Acts chapter 2. It's not even mentioned, it's really just implied was mentioned in Acts chapter 1. It's it's implied that these 120 disciples were in the upper room for 10 days praying. Praying. If you were not here Wednesday for a midweek prayer meeting, you need to go and watch the sermon from midweek prayer meeting, okay? Like you need to, especially if you're a member here, you need to watch it because we are calling this house to be a house of prayer once again. And you think Sunday is pretty important. Wednesday is more important if you're a believer. Because it is our opportunity to get into the upper room. And Sundays are the opportunity to get the upper room into the streets. That's what we're here today doing. But we need the disciples of Jesus to get in the upper room first and foremost. And I know that's difficult. I know it's hard. We have children. I have three of them. All under six. It's difficult. I understand that. But what's going to be more difficult is if I, as their father, do not weave prayer into the very fabric of their being. And when they're 20 and 30 and 40 years old, they do not believe in Jesus anymore. It's going to be more hard. I guarantee it. It's going to be hard to be a grandparent looking at my, looking at my, my kids and then their kids and none of them know Jesus. And they're going to go to a devil's hell if, because I just didn't want to come to a prayer meeting once a week. You get me? Okay, prayer, the sound of prayer in Acts chapter 2 was reverberating the room. And it was more than that. The, the, the disciples, they weren't hiding out at this point. They weren't hiding out at this point. They've already done that. Peter already denied Jesus three times, and, and he, was, he was ashamed of that. And Peter, they were not hiding out. There was a lot of indication that they would go from the upper room back to the synagogue, back to the temple courts in Jerusalem, and they would pray there as well. They, they weren't hiding out. 
They would just go to this upper room to get more intimate together corporately. They go out because they were still Jews. They still considered themselves Jewish. So they would go out and do all the things they were supposed to do by Torah law. And then they would come back to the upper room and pray and pray and pray and wait and wait. Because remember, Jesus said, wait, right? Some of your Bibles say, tarry. Some of you are like, who's Terry? It just means wait. Wait. Wait in Jerusalem, and I will send the Holy Spirit, and he will fall on you in power. Jesus never, this is interesting to me, and I've thought about it all week. Jesus didn't say, hey, go to Jerusalem for 10 days and pray, and then the Holy Spirit will come. But the disciples, they heard wait, waiting to the disciples like, oh, we got to pray about this. Waiting is not just sitting around. Waiting is doing something. Waiting is working and praying. So for 10 days, the disciples were waiting, but waiting equated praying, praying. How often are we praying? I won't re-preach from Wednesday. Go back and watch Wednesday. But we need to start actually praying all day, every day. How do we do that? We got to learn. We got to learn. I'm Me included. I got to learn. I've been walking around all week. When I get frustrated, I'm just sitting here in my frustration. And the Holy Spirit's like, pray, dummy. Pray. Talk to me. Talk to me. And I'm like, okay, oh, thank you, Jesus, for, for this terrible situation I'm in. Help me get through it. And I'm telling you, the power of the Holy Spirit will fall on me, even in my ignorance. We got to pray. They were praying in the upper room. They were praying in the temple. They were praying everywhere they were in Jerusalem. Because Jesus said, power would fall on you from on high. Some of y'all are expecting power without prayer. It's not going to work. It's not going to work. It's not working. You follow me? That those things that you're chasing in life that God has even put you on track towards, you're not stepping into them because you have no power, because you won't actually sacrifice your life and begin to pray. There is no power without prayer. The Holy Spirit decided to come after 10 days of constant corporate prayer. What? What? I mean, we put gas in our cars, don't we? And and if we didn't, if we knew we were on E, we would not turn it on and expect it to work and slam down on the gas and expect it to go. We put gas in. Well, you Tesla people don't put gas in your cars. I'm trying to be a Tesla person. That ain't happening yet. You put gas gas in your car. You plug your car in now, and you, you expect it to go after that. Why do we expect to never pray and get all of the power? Why do we expect to never pray and see our kids saved? Why do we expect to never pray and to see all of the diseases and ailments in our bodies go away? Why do we expect to even pray once a week or twice a week and see things happen when the disciples prayed for 10 days straight while living their life, while going to church, while having conversations, praying? Why do we expect all of the power and never praying? Why do we expect that? The devil's messed with us. The devil's twisted our minds. The, devil's, the devil is trying to, trying to place the grace of God in your face, and he's trying to make you idolize the grace of God like there is nothing else. Hey, Jesus saved you. You don't need to do none of this. And maybe on some theological level, you can, you can make that work. But I'm telling you, via the scripture, there is no way for you to get power without prayer. You have all the grace of God inside of you. Via who? the Holy Spirit, the one who came to commune with you, the one who came to talk to you, the one who came to comfort you. He can't comfort you if you never tell him what's going on. He can't comfort you if you never ask him. In the Bible, God himself says, this prophesying through a prophet, this will be a house of prayer. We will be a house of prayer, real love church, even if that's not sexy, even if it kills us. I will die on the hill of prayer. Amen? I will die on it. This is the only way I can connect to my Father. It's the only way I can give glory to the Son. It's the only way that I can get power from the Holy Spirit is making it a house of prayer. Fathers in the room, you need to go home today and say, this house that God has given us is a house of prayer. When I walk through the threshold, this is a house of prayer. My kids will know that this is a house of prayer when they grow up. If they ever go wayward, they will know dad, mom and dad's home is a house of prayer. And if I need something, I'm going to call them and I'm going to go home because they believe in prayer. 
They believe in the power of prayer. And, and the kids will more than just think you believe in it. They will see it if they've lived with you for five minutes. They will see that prayer works. It absolutely works. You heard that testimony from today. That wouldn't have happened without prayer. It would not have happened without a lot of fervent prayer. Lastly, you need to decide that you're going to be a house of prayer. If you believe in Jesus, whether you know it or not, you've been zoned already as a house of prayer. God looks at you and says, you are my temple. You are my temple. You see, the Jews are still scurrying around to rebuild the temple for a third time, and that will eventually happen one day. But it's just like they don't realize that the Holy Spirit wants to live inside of them. They don't realize that God paid a mighty price for them to become the temple. And no longer do we need brick and mortar. God just needs you. God just wants you. So this morning, when you hear the sound of prayer, are you the one praying? Or is it other people around you? If you hear everybody around you praying, realize that's your job too. You need to respond and be the temple. All 120 disciples were praying in the upper room. And the Holy Spirit fell and divided on all of them equally. That could be you this morning. That could be you this morning. The next sound is the sound of fire. The sound of fire rushed into the room. It set out like a mighty, rushing, violent wind. Y'all, church in 2024 is so boring. If a mighty rushing wind from the Holy Spirit came in here today, half y'all would leave because you would be offended because you don't believe in that kind of stuff. Half of you would leave, oh, the decibels were too loud, just like the sound is too loud. It's just like half of, we would be mad. Half of us would be confused. A quarter of us would be very okay with it happening. Like, I'm ready, let's go. Violent rushing wind. Our faith has become so sterilized. Our faith has become like whitewashed tombs. It's become a new religion. I am a Christian, and I go to church on Sundays, and every nine weeks I might pop in on a Wednesday when the ball game isn't on and when this isn't on and I'm not doing this. I am a Christian, banner of religion. And if God showed up the way he wanted to show up, half of you would be offended at him. If God did what he wanted to do in your life today, you would be questioning him, even though it would be way better even though he would give you power. In the upper room, a mighty, rushing, violent wind swooped through the entire room. Tongues of like fire split up on people physically. I find this so interesting. When, when God the Holy Spirit comes into the spiritual realm and moves, physical manifestations have to happen. Amen. And then more spiritual manifestations will have to happen and leave the mouth. It said that all of a sudden, by the Spirit's utterance, everybody that the Spirit gave utterance to started speaking in other tongues. This was not a phenomenon that they were used to. This is not a phenomenon that they had ever considered. But you see, when God shows up in fire, big things happen. If you light something on fire, it's hot, right? It's hot. It's hot. Is the church hot today? Is your life hot today? Is your faith hot today? Is your Bible reading hot? Is the temperature up? Is your prayer smoking, steaming? If it's not, you haven't responded to the Spirit at least consistently yet. When I was a kid, during the wintertime, we had a wood-burning stove. And um, sometimes I I would have to be the one to go down and make sure it's working. If it feels a little cold, i got to go down and make sure it's working. And if if the house was feeling cold... I was assuming the, the furnace wasn't hot. So I'd walk down to it, down to the basement, and I'd put my hand on the furnace, and I'd feel it. And that would let me know if it's burning or not. Look, this is not me judging you. I'm trying to call you higher. If you've got the most boringest Christian faith life that is cold, it's most likely dead. It needs to get restarted. It, it, it needs a spark in there. It needs something. It needs, I'm not saying you ain't saved. I'm not saying you don't have the Holy Spirit. But just like my furnace, there was a pilot light in there. And there was a blower on there blowing the pilot light into a flame. But oftentimes when I'd look in there, enough wood burned away and the last remaining stick of wood was not in the right position to catch fire. 
It was on the outskirts. It was on the edge. It was on the sidelines. You might have been sitting in the front row, but metaphorically and spiritually, you were in the back row, or maybe you were in the parking lot, or maybe you were at home concerned about lunch. I go to church. Why am I not on fire? Because you have not positioned yourself in the fire. You have not positioned yourself close enough to the Holy Spirit. You just want to be buddies with the Holy Spirit, but the Holy Spirit wants to totally consume you. So I had to move around that stick, get it into the flame, and all of a sudden that thing would start smoldering and catch fire, and then I could throw more wood in the furnace and catch more and more fire. I imagine this is just my practical, um, silly country way, even though you don't think I'm country. I just, I, I'm kind of country. <laughs> I, just, I don't look it, but I'm kind of country. This is my way of imagining that upper room the day of Pentecost. They were all positioned in prayer, waiting for the power so when the fire hit them, they ignited and they started setting off their own flames. Man, when those sticks of wood start to cook, they start to squeal, they start to scream. I'm not recommending everybody just get up and start squealing and screaming, but if the Holy Spirit sets you on fire, that's, that's on you to, to decide how you want to handle that. That's on everybody else to decide if they're going to be judgy in the moment or not. It starts to talk. It starts to communicate something that is hot in the house. It's hot in their house. We have to become a church that gets hot again. We have to become a church that contends for the fire of God. We all believe, like, we all believe, we all believe, but you need the fire to live out your belief. I believe, God, but would you give me the fire so I can live this thing out? Would you you give me your fire so when I walk into work, I won't get quenched? I won't get quenched by the culture out here. God, will you fill me up so if I happen to be scrolling on Facebook and see somebody I disagree with, God, it won't just ruin my day. Will you give me a little bit of fire? Will you give me some fire so when I go to school that the school doesn't dictate my fire, but I dictate the school's fire? Will you give me some fire, God, so when I step into the real world and the real devil comes and fights against me that he doesn't want to touch me because I'm hotter than where he came from? I almost said it, but that religious spirit might be in here. Would you give me some fire, God? I think that needs to be some of our cries today. God, will you give me your fire? Will you burn away all my misconceptions? Will you burn away all the things that I'm worried about? Will you burn away all of the questions? Because questions are coming. And I was talking to the team this morning. Two years ago, we started baptizing a lot of people. You know why? Because the fire of God's here and it's always been here. There's been questions. How in two years have you baptized 243 people? Yeah, real numbers. How? The fire of God. How have hundreds been saved? The fire of God. How can somebody come up during a worship service and get delivered of a demonic entity out of their life? The fire of of God. How, what does this mean? That's the question. What does this mean? When we started doing words of knowledge in September, we got a lot of questions. What is this? I don't know. The fire? I mean, God tells somebody something. They come up here, tell everybody something, and then half a dozen people come up and say, that was for me. They get healed, transformed, delivered free. I, I, I can't really explain the mechanics to you. I'm not your spiritual mechanic, but I want to be your pastor. And my answer is, it's the fire of God. I've seen too many people. I've seen too, too many miracles since September with the words of knowledge. So if you're coming here like, that's just kind of weird. You know what? We're all weird. We're all kind of weird. You might think my boots are weird. And you're right. I like weird boots. You might think somebody raising their hand is weird. They might think you doing this is weird. We all think we're weird. Can we stop being so concerned with everybody else's physical man- manifestations on how they feel the Holy Spirit? It ain't hurt nobody. It ain't hurt nobody. Yep. Well, I don't want to be part of that weird church. Well, go be, go be a part of that weird church then. Or that weird. Because they're all weird. We all believe that a man named Jesus Christ in Nazareth died and resurrected on the third day and is alive and, and flew up into the clouds and is coming back one day. Oh, and I forgot to mention he was born of a virgin birth. Like, we're all kind of weird. Can we at least agree on that? We're a little weird. You know, 
the fire of God does something. The fire of God, and we'll see it next week, takes a hothead like a man named Peter. And the fire of God hits him in that upper room, just like everybody else, and turns him into a powerhouse of a communicator for the gospel. This Holy Spirit, I know you feel like you're going to and fro, like, like James says, you're just, you're on one side of the wave and the other. You can't, your faith, you cannot connect with your faith. You need the Holy Spirit, the fire of the Holy Spirit to do that for you. Some of you, we, you've been walking in and it's just like, oh, what is, this, is this church turning into a Pentecostal church or something? They're doing words of knowledge. They, they're already been doing deliverances. It's just like, we are just trying to be a Holy Spirit filled church. When the Holy Spirit goes, I'm going to go. When the Holy Spirit says, do this, I'm going to do this. When the Holy Spirit says to, for me to say certain things, I'm going to say certain things. I will. I will. I've determined in the, of myself, Holy Spirit, you can do what you want inside of me. I don't care what the boundaries look like. I don't care what the boxes are. We'll bust out of them. I don't care. I, I am so unconcerned, and God will take care of us. Amen? God will take care of us. So when people are like, what does all that mean? Just, it means that Jesus loves you. It means that he is a supernatural God trying to come into the natural world, and he does that by fire. You have a sin problem. He wants to burn it out of you. You have a lack of power problem. He wants to set you on fire so you can actually do something. He wants to set you on fire this morning. And the question I have for us is, are we going to respond to the fire of God? Because it's going to come all of a sudden. Are you going to be ready for it? I would have hated to be in that upper room and not been ready for it. What if I was just spectating? What if I was mad because James over there took my seat? What if I was mad at at the kids pastor? What what if I was mad at what the worship leader was wearing? What What if I was just being me and then the Holy Spirit fell down and I wasn't positioned correctly? What if I was right outside of the door taking a phone call that I shouldn't have been taking? taking a bathroom break when we know the service lasts this long. Go beforehand. Let's go. I don't know if anybody stood up and just walked out. That was not what that was meant for. But what if I wasn't positioned to receive the Holy Spirit and I'm just sitting on the outside, seeing all my friends and family caught up in the Spirit, changing the world, changing the world in a moment of obedience. It happens so quickly. Church, you do not want to miss it this morning. I know you have appointments in your head that you're very concerned about, and they are very important, but there's nothing more important than you getting fully surrendered and filled up with the Holy Spirit of fire that can change you and change the world and change your family. Now, if you don't want fire, that's fine. If you don't want power, That's fine. Live your weak, little, anemic, Western Christian life. It's totally fine. Drive around town with your sticker on. It's totally fine. But one of these days, you're going to feel like you don't fit in because there's going to be more people with power in this room than with not power in the name of Jesus. Because where there's power, God blesses. Where there's power, there's proof, and the outside world are very interested and keen on figuring out what's on the inside. So you're going to start to feel like, I don't fit in here because I don't have the power. Get the power today. It does not come through works. It does not come because you're special. It does not come because you earn it. It it comes because you're open and obedient and positioned to receive it. There's power. There's power and there's proof that Jesus is alive in the power. How did you make it through that season? The fire of God, there's power. How did you go through chemo for six months and radiation for, for three months? And how did, how did you keep your spirits up? The power of God. It's the fire. How did you not cuss that person out when they were cussing you out? It's the power of God. It's fire. It's, I got the fire. I can't, I can't, I'm not going to apologize that I have the fire. How do you get up there and preach to 300 people that you're probably making mad every single time? It's the fire of God. It's not me. If it was me, I'd tuck my tail and run right now. If it was me, I'd quit. Ask my wife. Probably once a week. You know, I could just quit. Possibility, yeah? I just quit. Wouldn't put all this pressure on everybody. Wouldn't put pressure on myself. 
I don't because I got the fire in me. I got the fire in me and I let it go and I let it burn. And, and my goal is to, for it to get as big as humanly or supernaturally possible. There's proof in the power. These people that we say we're praying for and trying to save, they're not interested in your fake little Christian life that they see on Instagram because they see you at the basketball game cussing at the ref. They're not interested. They're not interested when they, when they, when they see you out in public and it's, there's a disconnect all of a sudden. They're not interested. These kids, these youth that we're trying to reach out here aren't interested when they see their elders just look at them in judgment like you weren't a kid once. How about let's be mothers and fathers going back a few weeks with some fire in us, some fire that's not afraid of some mess, some fire that's not afraid of some sinners, some, some fire that's not afraid of some disease. You think Jesus was afraid of disease? You think Jesus was afraid of ailments? You think J Jesus would have been afraid of COVID? Jesus would have been walking around in the crowds, healing people, helping people, feeding people with the fire of the Holy Spirit. So I don't know about you, I, I'm ready to rise up in fire. I'm ready, I'm ready to let the Holy Spirit do what he wants to do. Whatever it looks like, I'm ready for the Holy Spirit to heal you. Are you ready? I'm ready for the Holy Spirit to light your family on fire so you don't just have a cute little American dream, but you have a legacy of fire. So if people are writing history books 100 years from now, if the Lord tarries, if, if, he, stay, if he doesn't come back yet, if, he write, if somebody's writing history books, then maybe some of our names will be mentioned in the great revival in the Midwest. Man, in 2024, there was a revival that started in southwest Missouri, in the region of Seymour, Mansfield, Marshfield, Fordland. Name your town in there if you're from there. And oh my gosh, there, there was this family. They, they contended and they prayed for days and days and months and months and years and years. And revival happened and fire broke out and millions of people were saved in Missouri. Can you wonder what that would feel like? The world would be like... What does that mean? And they would come to know the fire of Jesus. So, I don't know how quickly God's going to do this for you. I know for me, I, I'm already past this point I'm, because I, I've lived through I lived through the fire alarm situation. When a fire alarm goes off, you don't have a choice but to respond. A lot of you are living a privileged Christian life right now. You think you've got a choice to respond right now because you can just walk out of here and leave it all here. But what if you changed your mind on that and you actually thought the fire alarm was real? And I, I'm not trying to do a hell fire and brimstone thing. I'm not saying like, oh, I'm so afraid of hell. No, I'm afraid of missing out on the fire of God that he has paid for me to receive in this moment. Because if I miss out on the fire of God, my wife's going to miss out on the fire of God. My three kids are going to miss out on the fire of God. All of my grandkids in the future are going to miss out on the fire of God. Y'all are going to miss out. If I miss out on the fire of God, it messes up eternity. It's a big deal. Oh, if the fire of God would just fall on us and in our room is what we pray and what we sing and what we really want to happen. But no, it should be, oh, if the people of God would actually wait and pray and tarry and wait for the Holy Spirit to fall. And not just that, but accept him when he does, the world would be changed all of a sudden. In a moment, everything could change. So let's stand, church, and think of yourself standing up into your promise, standing up into the fire of God right now if that's what you want. I know there's a lot of people in this room that want the fire of God, that contend for the fire of God. It's yours today. It's absolutely yours today. altar time seriously. We start taking them seriously. This isn't our opportunity as a church to get numbers on our boards. I'm not out here counting all these salvations and da 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 da, da and I ain't worried about all that. My concern is that I'm giving you an opportunity to actually respond to God today. Take this seriously to respond to the fire of God today. Everything can 
change right here in a moment. church. God is here. The fire is here. When I see people delivered of demons because they're real, when I see them delivered of demons, they came up looking all crazy eyed and they left with clear vision. It's the fire of God. The alarm is here. The time is now. God wants to move in this region right here and right now. 